Everyone, welcome on behalf of the German Marshall Fund to today's uh, discussion on China's soft power strategy in the Mediterranean region. This event is part of the Mediterranean program's ongoing strategy group seminars with a focus on China in the Mediterranean. On behalf of the Mediterranean program, I would like to thank the Compania di San Paolo, the Policy Center for the New South, and the Luso American Development Foundation for their support. My name is Francisca Lipke, and I am with GMF's Asia program based out of Brussels. I am very much looking forward to today's discussion and to having the conversation with our distinguished speakers. Before I introduce them, I would like to just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, if you have a question, uh, please, please feel free to submit it in the Q&A function on the bottom of the Zoom screen. And then we will hope to address them during the Q&A portion of today's discussion. And now I'm very excited to begin the conversation. Um, welcome to Ro and Marika for, uh, for, for being with us today. Uh, Dr. Roy Jelinek is a specialist on the China Middle East relationship. He closely examines China soft power uh, in the region as well as in, in the broader Mediterranean. Uh, he serves as a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute and is a researcher at the Israeli Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies. And Dr. Mareiko Olberg uh, analyzes the global implications of China's rise and is also the co-author of Hidden Hand, How the Communist Party of China is Reshaping the World. Marika is a senior fellow with GMF's Asia program and my colleague. And I'm very, uh, very happy to have you here with us today. I would like to begin the conversation by asking Marika to start us off with her perspective on China's soft power strategy as a whole. The floor is yours, Marika. Thank you so much for the for the kind introduction, Franzi. Really glad to be here um, today. Um, I'm 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 here for, as you already indicated, I'm here for the more the big picture stuff, and mainly we'll be talking about how the Chinese government or the ruling Communist Party of China conceptualizes its goals and approaches. There's two things I want to talk about um, in particular. The first one is the Chinese understanding of the concept of soft power and related concepts, how those were discussed in China in different periods and what that means for the understanding. And then the second thing I wanna to briefly touch on because I do think <clears throat> it's also important in relation to soft power is what's known as the United Front Principle and how that shapes how China or the Chinese government approaches the question of its own soft power. Now, before I get started, I don't usually use the concept of soft power as much in my own work because I feel often as an analytical category, there are some issues. These are all old questions. For instance, if a German CEO talks about how great the Chinese model of governance is, is he doing that or is she doing that because they generally believe it? Are they doing it because they're hoping they're getting more money out of it? And to what extent can the two be distinguished? Or another example, if a country welcomes China because they really hate the United States, is that part of China's soft power? So there's some problems of delineation, but these are all these are all really old stories, and I don't want to rehash them all. Other people have talked about this before. Just generally, why I usually um, don't use the concept as much. That said, the concept of soft power was is definitely shaped how the Chinese government thinks about its own <clears throat> its own role and its own conception of power in the world. Um, if you look at how the concept itself was received, you can find two different phases. The first was starting in 1993 or 1994, the mid-1990s, um, when soft power was first introduced by Joseph Nye. Back then, there was no full book. He just came up with it. And when it was <clears throat> um, received in China as well, and back then, it was mainly considered an external threat. So America is going to use soft power against us. And then in the second wave of receive, reception of this concept, after 2004, after Joseph Nye introduced the concept in more detail in his seminal book, um, the Chinese government began to think more about how can China actually not just view this as a threat, but develop its own soft power and use that. Um, part of the difference of that reading 
had to do with how it was viewed in America itself in the 1990s. There was the sense of triumphalism. We have won the Cold War, and now American ideas are going to win over the world. And consequently, it was viewed as a threat in China, whereas when Joseph and I reintroduced the concept, it was out of a sense of crisis that American soft power was waning, which was then seen by the Chinese government as an opportunity for China to develop its own soft power. Um, the shift in how soft power dis was discussed also accompanied a shift in how the CCP thought of its own regime security. In the 1990s, it was largely reactive. It's like, how can we keep all these bad ideas out of China? How can we fight off hostile forces? Whereas in the 21st century, the shift was towards more proactive measures. Um, the idea being that we can only get long-term ideological security for ourselves if we have increased global soft power or global normative power, discourse power, there are various terms that we use for it. So if we can set the standards, if we can set the tones, if we can set the debates, and if we are the most trusted actor, then that'll also be positive for our own power at home. Um, and, that's, and that's how this began to be approached. Now, some of the original traditional soft power debates will focus a lot on um, culture, on things such as Confucius Institutes, on cultural performance, maybe the cultural BRI, and that's all part of it, and that's an important part of it, but really the debate goes beyond that. There is a concept that China has also introduced that is known as discourse power, um, and it actually encompasses many different aspects that would be it would include cultural soft power, but it obviously also encompasses the influence of China's media. How many foreign media can China use to spread its own ideas, how many, how can it get others to repeat its main talking points known as borrowing votes. It does include the academic space, it does include Confucius Institutes. It also includes larger things such as building what's called a discourse system with Chinese characteristics. The example, the example being that you want to build theories for why the Chinese system is good, for why China is a responsible international actor. To give, to give an example of what a discourse system, a theoretical discourse system would be, you would maybe want to pay for foreigners receiving Chinese money would maybe not just state that China has dealt with COVID more successfully than Western countries, but would try to develop a theoretical framework for why China as an authoritarian country is more capable of doing that. So that would also be under the frame of discourse power, theoretical power. Um, but basically it's any form of normative power um, that is about <clears throat> that, um, is the power to define the categories in which the world thinks and to have a larger impact on how the world's organized conceptually, institutionally, including having more Chinese-led organizations, um, restructuring international organizations so that they can better serve the needs of China. Um, so th this would all fall under such conceptions and are, are tied together. Um, so this much for the conceptual part. The one other thing I do want to touch on briefly, because it's often it's, it often gets lost in in a lot of the win-win rhetoric that China puts out. Um, one criticism that you often get from the Chinese side is, you know, the West is caught up in this framework of the Cold War, um, is caught up in zero-sum thinking, whereas China is all about win-win and is culturally so fundamentally different that Westerners simply cannot conceive of this different mode of thinking and therefore think of China as an enemy. Um, now I have bad news. <laughs> uh, the, the Chinese, the China, China is led by a party that is very much caught up in Cold War thinking for which in a way, the, the old Cold War never quite ended. It is very much caught up in a, in, in a thinking of thinking in friends and enemies um, in thinking of itself as being locked in what is essentially a superpower conflict with the United States. And this is where the United Front principle comes in, where you, for the sake 
of building your international relations. You distinguish between friends and enemies. You have very many, officially you have very many friends, very few enemies. You have to identify one principal enemy in any, in any particular setting at the global level. That is the United States, the other superpower, which means that when there are conflicts between China and another power, it's usually framed as it's only the United States putting them up to it. For instance, if the Philippines cannot possibly have its own interests in the South China Sea, um, when Europe protests something, it's got to be because the United States is putting them up to it. Um, but the United Front principle is basically of building the broadest possible coalition against that principal enemy. So you want to make sure that you have, for instance, most developing countries on China's side when you try to go up against the developed world. You want to make sure that you can isolate the United States from its main allies around the world, which usually is a two-step two process, first getting them into a position where they are in a neutral camp, so where they don't pick sides, and then eventually you want them to side with China. And this is where normative power starts, plays a part of China hoping to be able to use its increasing discourse power to help support these goals. Now, I, I want to close because I don't, I, I'm, I really look forward most to the discussion part here, but I want, want to close by saying um, in the past, Chinese soft power, Chinese normative power, or Chinese discourse power, so China being able to set the tone, to set debates, to set agendas, was often dismissed either by saying, you know, um, the argument was, you know, China has very little that's attractive about its government system. It may have an attractive culture, but whatever it has, it's smothered to death by the, um, the wish of the Chinese government to control what goes out. Um, its talking points are ridiculous, nobody believes them anyway, and I do think, and I, I think we're slowly getting to that point, um, and I'm assuming my co-panelist will, will back me up on that, I don't think we should be that complacent, um, and there's actually quite a bit of normative power, soft power, discourse power, whatever you want to name it, that China has built up, that it is actually, it has gained a lot of support of people signing on to a lot of the narratives that it's promoting, and that it's therefore necessary that we start taking this more seriously than simply saying, oh, there's just autocrats trying to do autocrat things and they're going to fail. Um, I'm going to close with that, hand back to you, Franzi, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion later. Great, thank you so much, uh, Marika. I would have one brief uh, follow-up question before I turn to Roy. Uh, I'm curious um, because you you described the United Front principle in such great detail. If if there's one sort of brief example um, of what this could look like, uh, what this looks like in in practice. You can really you can see it at any level. So United Front principle re refers to a a power setup. A certain, a certain um, unit, either that's on the, the globe as a whole, but it could also be the EU, it could be an individual country. Um, so if you go to the country level, you could say, look, the German government itself is opposed to the Belt and Road Initiative. It does, has not officially signed on to. So what do you do? You make sure that you surround the center of power with other actors. In that case, you would go to to provincial governments, you would go to city governments, you would go to business councils, you would basically find all those allies in order to push back against what in this situation, the German domestic context is your principal enemy by surrounding them winning over all these allies so that ultimately the German government will feel like, oh, there's so much interest in us signing on to this, that we don't have a choice but to do it. So far that hasn't happened, but that's the basic idea. And you can, you can do that at any kind of level where you identify a center of power and surround it with smaller actors to try to overcome the resistance. Thank you so much, Marek. Roy, now it's time to turn to you for your take on uh, what the soft power strategy looks like in the Mediterranean region. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me for this uh, interesting webinar. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I like to focus 
uh, on the Middle East China relation, and if to be precise, the Chinese soft power toward the Middle East. I'm focusing mostly on the cultural and educational aspect that China use in order to influence the Middle East. I agree with uh, Marika, right? I said it correctly. Uh, that soft power is a, a bit problematic concept, but uh, I, I use it a lot. Uh, we can discuss the, the reason why later. Uh, if to give the bottom line in the beginning, China is very successful using soft power tools and clearly doing so uh, in order to shape their image among the, the local. And they do so, and they do it in the Middle East, in the Mediterranean and everywhere. They, uh, I will give you example of how they do it and how, they, how the success look like. Uh, if to use the word of, of the New York Times, I think in, in April, uh, a bit after the COVID-19 arrived to the US, uh, they said China has been able to reposition itself, not as authorization incubator of the pandemic, but as a responsible global leader at the moment of worldwide crisis, which is a great success uh, that, that we need to, to see and to look when, when we talk about China. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis provide as a great example for the success of the Chinese effort. The fact that over the past year during the COVID-19 pandemic with similarly to other countries in the world, the Middle East and the Mediterranean suffered and still suffering from it. The public opinion in this region has not turned against China almost at all. This is demonstrated in the local newspaper coverage on, coverage on the pandemic, the vast majority of which did not turn in criticize China and didn't raise any question, almost any question as to how hold China accountable for this pandemic. Uh, I really try to look for, for uh, in Arabic and Hebrew and in English, of course, to look for articles or, or uh, any other materials that came out of the local um, media that criticized China. I couldn't find much. I found only one thing, yeah, only major one thing in Israel uh, that someone tried to sue the, the Chinese for, I don't know, $2 billion, I don't remember. And the Chinese embassy in Israel, uh, I don't know what happened in the end, but they tried to get involved and to to ask uh, the government to, to get involved and to delete, to cancel this uh, suit. Um, so when addressing this topic, leaders, when, uh, when leaders address this topic, they focus in on, uh, on uh, asking for assistance from China, like uh, Egypt, in the beginning, uh, ask for a mask and get few deliveries uh, of essential medical aid like masks, gloves, medical producti uh, protective clothing and more. After uh, the, the Chinese announced they have the, the vaccine, they uh, uh, plans, they didn't do it so far, but in the beginning of, of this year, month, they announced, the Egyptian health minister announced that they plan to buy 40 million doses of the Sino farm vaccine. Uh, in Qatar, it was more or less the same. They asked for a more or less the same essential aid. Uh, the same was in Oman, in Lebanon, and many, many other countries. So it just makes sense that if they ask for this, uh, um, okay, I will take these words back. I'm not sure it makes sense, but if they ask this uh, um, aid, it's harder for them to, to criticize or to say something. Um, but I think that the, 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 the main reason why they didn't criticize and why they feel free to ask for assistance uh, is because the Chinese soft power uh, that we will discuss in a second I'll just give examples from the other side, like uh, many of these countries in the region, in the Mediterranean or the, or the Middle East, 
have no problem to criticize China, uh, to criticize the U.S., especially uh, during Trump uh, uh, term. And on the other hand, to get much, much, much more help, assistance in many aspects from the U.S. So it's not clear that if you uh, criticize a country or a superpower, you can't ask, you can criticize because uh, and, and the main difference is the system in the U.S. and the system in China. We will try to discuss it a bit more uh, later. Um, uh, in addition, uh, most of the leadership didn't adopt uh, President Trump accusation against China, which aimed to draw a clear link between the virus and China by calling it uh, the Chinese virus, which he used everywhere in every uh, talk he gave, in every stage he had. He tried um, to push this uh, thought, this uh, soft, he used soft power, uh, let's call it this way, uh, to, to make very, very clear a link between the virus and China. Um, okay, so we don't have much time. So how China do, do it? How China uh, success? How, how they are able to establish such a control system in the Middle East and in the, Mediter and in the Mediterranean? So for, uh, they developed for more than 20 years a network of agents in the region and again, it's not only there, but I'm focusing on the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Among this agent, we can include four cultural centers, one in Lebanon, one in Israel, two in Egypt, one in Alexandria, one, the second one in Giza, 15 or even more Confucius Institute in 12 different countries. If to name part of them is uh, Lebanon was the first in 2006, Jordan, Israel, uh, UAE, Qatar, Oman, Iran, Morocco, Algeria, and, and more that I don't remember. And if we uh, uh, take one minute to speak uh, uh, about Confucius Institute, which is very, very uh, essential and uh, um, um, major uh, Chinese soft power tools against not against, toward, I'm sorry, I'm taking the, the word against, toward the Middle East and other region. The Confucius Institute are an uh, institute that build only, and this is the major difference between this institute and for instance, the German uh, Goethe Institute or the British Council or many other uh, cultural uh, institute only within the universities and only with cooperation with the local university and cooperation between the local universities and Chinese university. Basically, they have a, a agent, doesn't matter which kind of agent in every, uh, not in every, all the universities they have, they need to sign a contract that say that we can't um, discuss few of the topic that China don't want, doesn't want uh, to be discussed in this university. And this is the first uh, step for Chinese to get into this university. After this, they will cooperate in many other fields, but this is the, uh, the, the first ticket uh, every university need if they want to cooperate with China. Uh, the main difference between the Middle East, let's say, and, the Euro in, and Europe and the US in this, uh, in this uh, uh, topic, in, about the Confucius Institute that, well, China, uh, well, uh, uh, in Europe and the US, the government started to, to notice and to see that this institute are working as a foreign agents uh, and they started to close this uh, institute. In the Middle East, they just open more and more every, every year, it's like few more and, uh, and they, and they have planned for more, more uh, in the future. Uh, another way the Chinese uh, find um, another part of the network is China Radio International, which operate in all the local language, Arabic, Hebrew, Turkish, and Persian. Uh, it's mostly not a radio, it's mostly a website that provide uh, the CCP 
a view to the local people. This is the main aim. This is what announced in their own website. Uh, um, they operate few more uh, media outlet in the region, like Xinhua, China Daily, CCTV, and more. But those uh, media outlet is more from the region toward the to, to inform the, the Chinese people about the region. But we need to ask ourselves why this journalist uh, stay in this country with a diplomatic passport and not with a, a passport like all the other journalists. Um, and the last part of this puzzle is people-to-people -people, uh, diplomacy. The general use of this method of a P2P method is connecting influential individual in connecting individual from the region like politician, government official, journalist, academician, business people, and many, many cases is a former diplomats, among other. Marika, in your book, A uh, Hidden uh, Hand, I saw a few examples from Canada and from, oh, help me, where from? Okay, help me later, uh, from a few other countries, um, which the objective to explore, to exposing them to the official uh, Chinese discourse and national interest, and then they feel very close to it and they, adopt this idea and they play as, I think, maybe the best uh, agents. Uh, and, and, and it's cost nothing. You don't need to put a lot of effort in order to have them. Another expression of the success of the Chinese power in the region can be seen in the Pew. Um, no, I will get it. Uh, I will finish with this. Uh, um, I will sum up now. China has been investing widely in building sophisticated mechanisms throughout the Middle East in order to have direct access to the people as well as intentionally, as we said, uh, focusing their attention and effort on the elite population. Because uh, uh, the reason is very simple. If you influence one major person in, in, uh, that he has or she has, a lot of a uh, Twitter uh, follower or Facebook or whatever, you you will send the message to much more people and with a, a very a little of effort, very small effort. Um, if to judge according to the local reaction to the COVID-19, without doubt, I think without, maybe uh, one of the audience will light my uh, eyes, but. Uh, came from China and was handled badly by the local authorities there. The Chinese have great soft power impact over the Middle East. The contribution of its agenda being accepted almost indisputably. Uh, unfortunately, the Pew uh, survey of 2020 was not uh, dealing with um, with the Middle East, but the Pew 2019 uh, survey, Lebanon was uh, served in a, uh, there is show that uh, in Lebanon, Israel and Tunisia, China is viewed favorably, even more so than in view of Africa and more than the year before, meaning it's just increasing and people I can say in Israel, where I live, I live in Jerusalem, uh, 66, of the, no, more, yes, let's say 66 of the people see China as a good place. And it's just increasing every every year, according to this uh, survey. Um, yeah, and in Israel, I can say they did very, very, very well job. Um, okay, this is maybe for a different time. Thank you very much for listening. I hope it was not too long. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the QA session to discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roy, for your comments and, and insights. Uh, before I turn to the audience for questions, which are slowly starting to come in, and please feel free to submit them as, as, as you uh, come across them. Um, just one follow-up question. You briefly mentioned that, uh, and you thought you maybe would want to elaborate, um, that 
it seems no problem for, for Israel and for others to criticize the US under the, uh, you specifically mentioned the Trump administration and, uh, but, but take assistance or, or work together on certain projects. But this is not necessarily uh, the case with uh, Israel's relationship with, uh, with China. Do you care to elaborate a little bit maybe on, on why that is or how you will more forward looking how, how this relationship will continue? Uh, I can try. Uh, I think that uh, the, the main difference is, is the, the, the relationship with, I think there is few differences between the relationship between the China and the US uh, and relationship with Israel. Mostly uh, Israel and the, the US have common uh, values and very long uh, relationship with China we don't have it, we doesn't, uh, we don't have it, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, where the, the relationship between Israel and China are very limited due to the US, meaning the US is the most influential part of the Israel-China relationship. We had few crises because of it. Um, but if to go back to your specific question, it's, it's just easy to criticize democratic country that even their own citizen can criticize it and can de discuss it and can express their views. Well, the, the case in China is not this case. This is, I think, and, and therefore the people from outside adopt this, uh, this, um, this same uh, uh, way of action. And China, in contrast to the US will make you pay if you make uh, big mistakes. Meaning if you criticize, I can say from my own experience that when I said something wrong, let's say, I got invited to the embassy here to explain myself. I never heard about someone that came to the uh, US embassy and needed to explain themselves. Uh, so I think basically, um, this is the reason I answered your question. Yes, great. Thank you for, for um, elaborating a little bit more. This is great. Um, we have some interesting questions coming in that I would like to, to give our audience the opportunity uh, to pose their question. Um, Roy, actually, I will continue with you because we have uh, one question posed. Um, does the Uyghur, Uyghur, I'm sorry for my mispronunciation, issue have negative effect on China's soft power in Muslim majority countries other than Turkey? And if so, has uh, vaccine diplomacy changed in any way? And before you, before you answer, um, I also have another question and I would pose this to Marek afterwards. I thought we could uh, uh, group a couple questions together. Um, what can break that friend versus enemy circle in view of the need to work together to face the global challenges that we have like COVID, climate change and so on. Um, is it because uh, neither the West or other blocs don't want to or is it because of interests of certain industries? And this question comes from Nico Kepins, thank you. So Roy, do, would you like to start up off? Start us off, apologies. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um... Okay, who, who asked this? Uh, so it doesn't matter. So um, uh, I can say that um, the Uyghurs, maybe unfortunately or unfortunately, uh, suffer from this soft power more than everyone else because uh, if we judge about the last uh, letter sent by uh, 38 countries to support China uh, um, behavior in Xinjiang, the, the, the part of China where the Uyghurs live. 11 or 12 of these countries are Muslim countries that support, uh, no matter what China doing there, they support it. Uh, and the Turkish changed their mind uh, a lot of time about this topic. Uh, once Erdogan can said it uh, was uh, that the security of, uh, of Turkey depend on China, meaning 
we are very close and we need to collaborate in order to fight the Uyghurs. And a few months later, or uh, he can say that uh, China uh, um, ma making, not making a genocide of the Uyghurs. Uh, so the, the Turkish changed their mind many, many times. Uh, but as far as I know, there is no uh, Muslim countries that support the Uyghur uh, now, these days. And they pretty by uh, themselves. Uh, uh, not only by themselves, maybe the UN try, maybe the US, maybe part of Europe, but the Muslim countries just uh, um, let this uh, issue go. Thank you, Marika. Um, yeah, maybe to quickly follow up on that, I, yeah, I also have very few hopes on any of the governments. I do think there may be some chance in creating more awareness at the level of the overall population for, for, for the plight of the Uyghurs in China, because it is a major issue that we will need all the support we can get for. Um, now about the, the friend and enemy distinction, I mean, if that's the million dollar question, how can we, how can we overcome friend and enemy thinking on all sides? Um, the, my, my, my main point here was what I was arguing with my point is we often get that some people make that argument, you know, if we, including the Chinese embassy, if we treat China as an enemy, then China will act as an enemy. And the problem with this rhetoric is that the Chinese government, as it is, is already caught up in this kind of Cold War thinking of distinguishing between clear friends and clear enemies and seeing this as a very clear competition. So no, if we start treating China as our best friend, that's not going to eliminate how the Chinese government thinks about the other side of this. Um, I don't think, honestly, I, I, I do think there are good reasons on all sides for this kind of thinking. Um, I understand why the Chinese government is concerned about its regime security and wants to help prop up its own regime security as much as possible. If you're not kicked out of office through an election, but through some other kind of form of power change, that makes you want to do that kind of thing. I don't think it'll be easy to get rid of this thinking on any side. So I do think it's more a question of to what extent can we still cooperate on issues such as you know global health, where yes, it's absolutely needed. To what extent, how, despite this general rivalry and this kind of thinking that we're unlikely to get rid of, can we still work with China on climate change? Can we possibly work with China on, I don't know, arms control or any other matter that is specific and limited to a certain relatively small delineated topic? Is that possible? I don't know. Um, it's certainly necessary, um, but that is something that I see as more realistic than trying to um, overhaul the entire system of how different countries view, conceive of one another and, and the, the approach that they take. Um, and that's something that I would, I would advocate for is to pursue more specific cooperation. Thank you both. And we have a few more questions coming in, which is great. Um, so I'm gonna group three questions together and then the two of you can pick and choose uh, which ones you'd like to answer. Um, one question coming in is, are there any notable exceptions in terms of countries who do not wholeheartedly support China in the Middle East? Um, and then a little bit more forward looking and also with, with re regard to the US, uh, China has certainly gained ground in the MENA region over the past few years, but how much of that is by default? due to Trump's foreign policy, which passes some military elites, was seen as regressive. Will that change uh, going forward? And then um, we have, is it China's only soft power, culture, language, Confucius Institutes in the Middle East for which the countries do not hold a negative attitude towards China? Or there, is there something else, like the persistent tensions between the US and its allies? If uh, you, the two of you would care to elaborate there as well. Marek, would you like to start us off or Rui? Sure, I can get started. I mean, essentially, I think those last two questions, like to what extent, 
how much soft power does China have by default in the Middle East? And to what extent is you know, Trump driving this, the United States driving this, other conflicts driving this? And that's that's ultimately what I what I was trying to get at in my introductory remarks about the concept of soft power. To what extent is a country's existing dislike of the United States a resource for China? And obviously, the Chinese government would absolutely count that among its major resources. So when it thinks about you know what are opportunities here in this particular region, region what what can we exploit? Um, you can, of course, argue if that is actually soft power or if that is just, you know, lack of experience with this particular power that is China and the region. And to some extent, I do think um, as more countries are confronted with China as a global power in their own region, some of that initial goodwill that is currently that China still receives for being a relatively new global actor may actually diminish. You can see some of that already in Europe where some of the countries where China has been more active in the Belt and Road Initiative, their populations actually have a more negative view of China than some other regions where China is not as active. Um, you know, and, and there's the example of Cambodia where the Cambodian government is incredibly close to the Chinese government, but there are, I think, few populations in the world that hate China as much as the average Cambodian. So I, I do think some of that goodwill may eventually evaporate as people gain more experience with how China acts on the ground. But for the time being, China definitely views the missteps of the United States as a big plus for its own normative power in the world. Where again, you can see it's, it's very much a zero sum thinking. If the United States is less popular, if people hate the United States more, we can use that. And that's not, that, that is true. That is absolutely true. And therefore it makes sense that the Chinese government takes that into account. I just don't know that it's gonna last forever. Roy, uh, your, your thoughts. I, I will just uh, I will ask back a question. Um, let's just imagine that this COVID-19 would come from a weaker a country. What would happen to this country? Uh, by saying that you can, I don't know, we have audience from, I guess, from many countries. Let's think that this uh, COVID-19 would come from a Okay, no, I don't want to pick any countries and then I will be in trouble with the people from there. Um, China uh, um, established very, very hard um, mechanism that helped her to uh, act. Uh, and I'm not to, to act and to control, let's say, not to act, to control the, the public opinion about them. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that uh, it's only because Trump uh, did this or this. Uh, I'm sure it's contributed a little bit, but I think that they they would find any way uh, the way to the heart of the people. Um, yeah, that's all for this. Okay, great. So then we can uh, move on. We have. Uh... Some, another round of questions waiting waiting for us. Um, I'll start off with, with a couple more questions and again, group them together before I turn to the two of you. Um, what are the interests of China in the Middle East with respect to regional alliances? Um, isn't the recently created Asia-Oceana trade agreement the biggest example of using soft power and, is, and how far is this agreement a threat to the EU? Um, let me see a third question. Ah, how um, is wolf warrior diplomacy viewed in the Middle East? Um, how has it affected China's image in the Middle East? Uh, Roy, I know you mentioned that public opinion hasn't changed too much, but um, perhaps there are some other discussions going on in, in the background. I'll start uh, with Roy this time. <laughs> um, what was the first question I missed? I tried to look for it. Uh on the, what are the interests of China in the Middle East? With respect to regional alliances, correct. Um, 
So the, the, I'm not sure I 100% understand the, the question, the, the second part of it, but um, the Chinese uh, have few interests in the region. The first one is, uh, of course, uh, the, from the economic perspective, and it's uh, lay more in the Gulf countries. Uh, Saudi is the um, most important uh, oil importer for uh, exporter for uh, for China. Uh, Dubai is a very essential uh, uh, hub for uh, finance in the region and not only in the region. Um, and, and many other countries supply uh, to the to China, mostly oil and gas. Um, China uh, needs the, the routes that go over the, the the Middle East, especially the Suez Canal in uh, in Egypt, uh, and all this area. It's very it's highly important for them. Now I, I just heard that uh, Israel and the UAE, after they signed the peace uh, deal. They try to find a, a different route, a different way uh, uh, than this West Canal. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to happen, but we'll see. Um, and as every other uh, superpower in the past, meaning the French, the British, and after this, the Soviets and the American wanted to control the area. Uh, Maybe even without any speci spe special reason, the Chinese want to have this footprint there. Uh, they try to, uh, they, they, one of the unique, and, and I think that we, we just speak, a bad, let's say badly about the Chinese, it's not only bad, they, they offer something very, very unique for the uh, Middle Eastern people for most of the Middle Eastern people, they offer them a different, a new and unique a way of governor that successful from the economic uh, perspective uh, and don't threat the, the political structure uh, they, they already have and adopt. Uh, so this, uh, uh, having said that, they, they, not having, I'm sorry, in addition that, that uh, uh, the Chinese uh, able to uh, communicate, let's say with Israel and Iran in the same time, which is a great uh, achievement. Uh, maybe in the future they will be able or willing, I'm not sure what of the two, to, to do something in a, uh, in connecting the two. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but they have the ability to discuss with everyone in the region, no matter uh, uh, what the conflict between the, the locals. All right. To add to add to that, I mean, obviously, a lot of a lot of the interest is about energy security and then some country specific things. Um, I, I guess one other thing you can you can put on top of that is just having generally more allies and in international organizations where you just need allies to vote with China to make sure that, you know, the human rights Absolutely. against China doesn't go through, that when countries organize to write a letter about the situation of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, you have enough countries to draw on to write a counter letter that is signed by then even more countries. So that is also, of course, where Middle Eastern countries come in. Not the main role, but certainly a, a, a good side effect. I don't know about the wolf warrior diplomacy. I guess the question would be, is it wolf warrior diplomacy targeted at Western countries? In that case, I'm sure there are some people who go like, that's probably, you know, that's that's great. And, you know, you want to push back a little harder. I don't know. And I, I don't know, Rui, if you have looked into this, if there are actually any wolf warrior diplomats, so very aggressive diplomats that actually push back locally and that are very vocal locally, or if it's more like you previously described as it's a lot of that aggressive stuff is taking place behind closed door, for instance, such as asking people such as yourself to come to the embassy and explain yourself. My, my impression is that it's the latter, but to assess how wolf warrior diplomacy would be received, you would really need to know 
if you know to what extent does it even exist targeted at the Middle East and my sense is not so much I, I agree with you I, I need to look more for it because now it's uh, uh, I, I have nothing to it let's say let's put it this way but I took a note and I will go back to you with it Great, thank you both. Um, I, we have time for a couple last questions. Um, one of them would, came in saying, what is the overlap between Chinese presence in multilateral organizations in Europe and its soft power presence in the Mediterranean? And uh, another one last question would also be, now that uh, in, in the week's time, approximately um, the Biden administration will be, uh, will, will, come to, uh, will come to power in, in the US. Um, do you foresee, um, any changes or anything um, get uh, alt anything changing in the Mediterranean or in Middle Eastern regions um, with respect to uh, to this change in administration in the U.S. Mariah, could you do you want to start us off? Um, I'm less sure because I'm not an expert in the region in in, in Europe, at least on the European side of the Mediterranean. Um, I, I do think there is going to be an impact which we can already feel to the extent that it becomes, it does become easier obviously to work together again, not that it's becoming perfect and not that, you know, there aren't existing conflicts still between the European side and the US side, but definitely um, it's going to be easier to at least suggest to work together with the Biden administration, whereas before I do think the Trump administration um, had definitely strengthened calls for more strategic autonomy on the European side. And that's, that's not gonna go away. And I don't think that it necessarily has to all go away, but it will make it easier to at least talk, to at least coordinate some of the initiatives in advance. So the question is more, more going to be to what extent will Europe and the United States be willing to try to actually push back um, in some of the arenas where they should push back um, and whether they would still be willing to introduce certain legislation that can help at least make sure that European actors um, aren't involved in, you know, the worst of China's human rights violations. But it's definitely going to be easier to cooperate, hopefully. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, slight going, going into 2021 slightly hopefully. I will say from the Israeli side or from the Middle Eastern side, that uh, we already, I, I will start with Israel, uh, that after um, a few difficult between uh, Israel and the US because of the, the Israel relations with China, uh, I already saw in the newspaper that the Biden administration sent a clear message to the Israeli government that this thing will be the same, meaning Israel will still be caught out to, to the same uh, a border uh, uh, in the trade between uh, China and Israel and the cooperation with mean no, uh, uh, no, nothing that related to military, not, high, not everything that related to HIDEC. Um, and in the other uh, area, uh, I think that the, all the leaders will try to understand what uh, Biden will offer them in contrast to what the Chinese can offer them. And they will start to try to negotiate and to see who will give them more. Um, and I think it's not unique for, the, for this administration. It's, this is the di dynamic of the region. And I think this will, be the, will keep being the dynamic of this uh, uh, relationship, triangle relationship. And uh, Roy, do you also want to tackle the question regarding the overlap between Chinese presence and multilateral organization located in Europe and also its soft power presence in the Mediterranean? I don't have much to say about it. Marika, maybe you have something to say? Um, I mean, 
I, I, I guess the only thing, I mean, some, some of the, the strategies, I don't know if this actually gets at the core of the question, but I'll, the way I read it is some of the strategies are the same um, in that China creates parallel international organizations to existing ones where usually the, you have the case, and this is the case with, you know, 17 plus one um, in Europe that you have China as the strongest country. And it's, it's actually a pseudo multilateral institution because it's, you know, it's one on one relationships always between a smaller European country and a larger a larger China um, and making sure that there's not too much bargaining power accruing on the other side. And that's, that's just generally a pattern that is used in other areas as well. Those are usually presented as multilateral. They're usually presented as not being a challenge to existing international institutions. It's like, you know, you can, you can tell Turkey, you can be part of NATO and you can be part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization because we're all, you know, there's no, 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 um, no contradiction between that. Um, and that's just a pattern you see in many different places, but I'm not familiar enough with the circumstances in the Mediterranean to say, and you know, this is exactly the same in this and that particular instance, but as a general pattern we can see in, in how China approaches quote unquote multilateralism. Thank you, Marike. And uh, we're actually coming to the last couple minutes of, of today's session and um, it's been a very uh, interesting discussion, um, interesting to hear uh, what the soft power looks like in the Mediterranean region and in, in the Middle East, um, to see that it's been you know, fairly successful and that it's expanding in terms of centers and in, in terms of other avenues and that uh, public opinion has uh, not changed in any uh, unfavorable direction, which is not the case in, in other parts of the world. Um, but also putting it, thanks to Marek, also in a broader context of, of uh, Chinese soft power strategy overall and how this uh, will also look like a little bit going forward. Uh, there's a lot of things at, uh, in play with uh, the changing US administration, with um, um, countries' reactions to human rights violations, uh, agreements being signed, all, a, lot of, a lot of things uh, in, in flux at the moment. Um, I want to thank... Uh, Thank our speakers, Roy and Marika, for, for their insights and perspectives today. And also thank you to our participants and guests for their time and, and uh, their questions. So thank you, uh, best wishes, and hope to see everyone next time. <laughs>